I went to AU, and uh, it's really great to be back here uh, after, unfortunately, it seems like a, quite a long time, because I graduated exactly 20 years ago um, this spring. And it doesn't seem possible that my identity then uh, could be the same as my identity now, but I assure you that it is. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about an idea and a concept around you. And it begins with a question. Who are you? I don't know if you've ever maybe laid in bed at night thinking about that question or maybe out in the yard looking at the stars and thinking about your role in the universe, where you fit. This is an idea that is actually something that is very, very central to who we are. Uh, Sigmund Freud really looked at the idea of id and the ego and the superego. And he determined from his research that our identity, which is made up of the id and the, the super id, are really central to the idea of character. That our character comes from our definition of identity. And this is an issue that has transformed over time. It was the year 1762 when Jean-Jacques Rousseau published an idea called the social contract. And for those of you who might be history students here at AU, you would know that this was the foundation, the first kind of publication that set the stage for the idea of the modern citizen. So Rousseau said that the monarch uh, did not necessarily have complete control over his subjects, that the subjects had rights and responsibilities that were equal, and that those equal rights and responsibilities formed this idea of a citizen. And this was really the foundation, the kind of wellspring, for something that happened a little bit later called the French Revolution. And it was also an inspiration for the American Revolution, this idea of the social contract. And so really what we're talking about here is the kind of foundational thinking of democracy, and in many ways, the modern nation state. So the social contract, 1762, fairly important moment in terms of what happened next, which was the formation of legal identity for us as a citizen, because who grants our identity from a legal standpoint? In almost all cases today, and for the last 200 years, the answer is the nation state. But I would propose to you that maybe that's not enough. And the reason is that increasingly, we live in a world where our identity and part of our existence is online. So this is a little graph of people in the United States who were hacked last year, people who experienced a data breach. Almost a billion people, probably all of you in this room, or nearly all of you, in one way or another. And the information that exists online about you, what we call PII, or personal identifying information, is held not by you. And it's also not owned by you. You contribute that information, or you generate what we call data exhaust in one way or another. And this information is put into the cloud and onto the internet, but it's not owned by you. It's certainly not maintained by you. You don't have any real rights around it, and you certainly don't have many responsibilities around it. So this is sort of the consequence or the benefit of having a lot of really great free services. So in the social web, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or Google, you're contributing information and data about who you are, who your digital identity is, and that actually is owned, that information is owned by the organizations that provide you those free services. And that's a pretty good thing, um, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it might not be the right thing for the way that we're going forward in the future. So you here, all of us in this room, what we might consider global elites just by the luck of circumstance and birth, um, we have a, a real problem around digital identity online. But there are other people around the world who potentially have an even bigger problem, especially in a world where the smartphone is transforming everything. So there are almost 8 billion people in the world, and there are almost 6 billion smartphone connections. By 2020, 80% of the world's population will have access to the internet via some kind of smart screen. And the consequence over the last couple of years of that is that many people have figured out that it's not that difficult to change their location to possibly better their life. And the result of that is that we're seeing an explosion right now in migration. Part of this is driven by climate change. Part of it is driven by war. If you look at Syria in particular, there are millions of people on the move right now from the Near East, and they're all heading towards Europe. They're moving across 
the oceans, and they're moving really just any way they can to try to find a better life. Some of them are pure, what we call refugees. Some of them are economic migrants. And the numbers are very large. Right now, the UN, HCR, which is the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, estimates that there are 58.5 million displaced people. Of them, 30 million are under the age of 18. So we're talking about an, an issue that is largely affecting, in many ways, children. 20 million of those people are new refugees. Like literally just in the last two or three years, they've been displaced from their homes and they've hit the road. Generally, they're walking. And just in the last six weeks, over 82,000 people have washed up on the shores of the Mediterranean trying to get into Europe. This is a huge issue. You don't feel it so much here in the US, except for maybe when people talk about building walls around borders. But in other parts of the world, this is becoming like a really big issue and it's having enormous political consequences. Largely as a result of those 82,000 people that are washing up or the 5,000 people that are camped out at the Eurostar tunnel trying to get into the UK, countries are now talking about exiting the Euro, exiting the European Union. There's a vote coming in June with the UK to talk about that very issue. So this idea of technology, some relation to where we are online and who we are, is having huge, huge consequences on the daily lives of all of us, even though it's not necessarily totally visible. Right now, there are almost 1.3 million people trying to seek asylum to gain a European identity. This is a very large number of people, and the structures that we have from a governmental standpoint are not equipped to deal with this at all. If you talk to aid organizations, if you talk to NGOs, if you talk to governments, nobody's quite sure what to do. They're not sure how to verify who these people are, to tell who's a refugee, who's an asylum seeker, who's simply trying to get a better job or a better life. It's really hard to tell because there's no real consistent view of identity. And then think about the perspective of the person who's trying to seek that identity. What kind of self-worth, what kind of self-image do you have when you're a child that was born without an identity given to you. You don't have a country to call home. So these are issues that we think call for a new idea. And we think of this as a digital social contract. There are rights and responsibilities for citizens that exist in the physical world. And there should be, there could be, and there will be rights and responsibilities for citizens in the digital world. And our view is that everyone, no matter where you are or where you come from, who you're born to, deserves to have some level of basic kind of digital social contract, some digital human rights. And those rights, in our view, are based around a few ideas. Some of them are transparency, the right to some level of privacy, and the ability to create a persona. And that ability to create a persona, have transparency and privacy, are all linked to how the data is managed that's being created online. Because all of this is really going to be online and digital in some way. So it raises these really big questions. Who's going to own the data? How's the data going to get used? Who's going to control the use of the data? Who might be able to monetize the data? Is it you or a company or a government? But what's interesting is that the growth of data across the web is making this happen regardless of whether or not we want to have it happen on an individual basis or if you're a company, if you've no way to monetize it or to use it. It's kind of emerging because there's so much data flowing onto the web about everything that we do. And this actually creates huge risks. So this is one of the best examples from the 20th century, uh, the dangers of applying labels to people. This was a symbol system that the Nazis used to really mark and to label prisoners. So on the top you see the countries, those, that's Belgium and France and Poland, and on the bottom, these were labels that were used for the types of person, if they were gay, if they were Jewish, if they were handicapped. And then on the left there, you see whether or not they were considered a flight risk or somebody who might cause problem in a camp. This had tremendous negative consequences. Millions of people died because the state was able to create identities that created information about people that could be used against them. And we are very lucky that we live in a society where generally we believe that the government is not out to 
destroy us. And you know, I think we could all agree that that's the case. But there are some places in the world where the government is out to destroy certain types of people, people who don't agree with them, people who object to the use of power or corruption. And it really is, I think, a very clear idea for many Americans and many people around the world that the power of this kind of data around your identity probably shouldn't be in the hands of the state. And there's a huge debate going on right now in this country between, say, Apple and the FBI about whether or not certain types of power should be in the hands of the state or in the hands of a corporation. Our view is that neither is really the ideal choice for holding this kind of power. It should actually be you, the individual. So these are two of my favorite people in the world right now. Um, in December, uh, we went to Frankfurt to meet with refugees who had arrived in Germany and sought asylum. And so on the left side is Maliki, and on the right side is Hussan. I think of Hussan as the kind of AU graduate of refugees. He's extremely lucky. He and his family lived in Aleppo, which was being bombed. And they left Aleppo and they walked from Syria through Turkey into Europe and made their way to Germany. And in Germany, they sought asylum and they were granted asylum. They're, it's, they're literally like the 1% of refugees who've been able to get that. And they're now trying to build a new life for themselves in Frankfurt. We went to see them because we've started issuing digital identities that are individually owned, that put data ownership into the hands of the individual. To his left is Maliki. Maliki is what you could consider privileged. He lives in London. His mom works with us in our company. And he wanted to come and kind of see what all this was about. But what you really see here are two kids having dinner. And they're quite equal, you know? They hang out. They went to the mall together. They both like video games. Very, very similar outcomes today, but very, very different backgrounds. But online, where their digital identities reside, they like actually pretty similar. They're both under 18, so they haven't added a lot of data to their identity yet, but we're helping them create a digital ID, the world's first digital passports that aren't issued by a government. And these digital IDs are what we call hub ID. There's his mom, who has a little bit more information, and you see that she's building this kind of color wheel around that represents data, but doesn't actually share the data that she's put in to something that we call a personal data vault. And then over there, because I do this every day, a little bit more information, some tags about things that I'm interested in, more data sources, authentication. So what we're enabling is the ability for people to upload data to a vault, to translate and tokenize that data into a string, and then to be able to share and use that data for their own purposes. But the key element of this information is that we're providing two things. One is privacy and anonymization by taking the data, putting it into a vault, and then transferring it into something we call a hash string. So this hash string can be written to the web and, and enables privacy for the user, but still the ability to kind of decode aspects of that identity so that it can be used around the internet. This is really important because there are lots and lots of ways that you could actually make that valuable. And for a person, especially, who doesn't have a national identity or um, a driver's license or a passport, this starts to become a basis for which they can claim a, a global digital identity and get access to maybe financial services or eventually health services. And what's interesting is that all the data around this is starting to merge into like a really vast data string. So this is actually a genome. Now I'd like to say it's a person's, but it's actually an elephant's. I could only find an elephant's genome on the web. But the basic idea is the same. We're really close to being able to take and decode your own individual genome and add that into an identity string so that you can have basically your genome as part of your digital identity. Completely unique, completely unreplicated, unreplicatable, and then really tying into other biometrics like a fingerprint or an iris scan or other things like that. This is the future of where identity is going on the web. Soon, all of us, will have access to, or will have created for us, whether it's our choice or not, some form of digital identity strings that determine our capability for identity on the internet. 
again, we feel that it's really crucial, it's super important that people understand now the idea that they should and could own that data. Part of that has come from some work that we've done with MIT and with other leaders who are thinking about digital identity and the way that we live our lives online. And there were a couple of retreats at Bretton Woods where these people sat down and they talked about what the future looks like, say looking 10 or 20 years out for digital identity for people, and what should be the rules, what should be that digital social contract. And the formation of that digital so social contract came down to a set of principles, and we called these the wind hover principles. And they've been published and you can look for them online, but they basically have five major points. One is that we all, no matter where we're from, deserve self-sovereignty online. The ability to be your own person and to basically be sovereign or self-governing in terms of your identity at the very least. You should be able to control your personal data. So you may choose sometimes to give up ownership of parts of your data. If you're getting maybe a service that you want, it could be free or even be paid for some level of service for trading over that information. But you should be able to control that. It should be up to you about how that data gets used. The enforcement of this should be transparent. There are, there are instances where a government or other groups may need to see aspects of your identity, like if you're trying to go to, a, say, a, a bar, and they need to check a, an ID to make sure you're 21, which I remember being a very big issue when I was here at AU. <laughs> um, but really on a larger scale, like when you talk to the governments, what they're really talking about is money transmission. When you're moving money around and between people, they wanna make sure that that's being done in a legal and appropriate way. The other thing is that we should ensure trust and privacy around this data. The, the way that the data gets used should not be used to exploit you. Like if you're adding health information and genomic information, should an insurance company or a health company be able to have access to that data to make a decision about the, the premiums that they're charging you for your insurance? This is a very, very real issue that the insurance companies are looking at. From an insurance standpoint, they say, hey, this helps reduce the risk, so we can offer you a lower cost for your insurance if you're not at risk. But what if you actually are at risk for certain things, and that means that your health premiums go skyrocketing through, through the roof? That doesn't really bode well for people who maybe need that insurance the most. And then finally, this idea that this should be open source. It's a kind of rail or an idea that anybody can build on and anybody can ride on. The idea that this information and the access to this information should be open source and that we can all together create not only the use cases but the benefits for it is really, really important. So these are some of the aspects around digital identity that we're looking at. We think it's really important that people understand this idea that you deserve to own your own data and we're helping people generate those identities online today so that they'll be able to use them in new and innovative ways tomorrow. So certainly a need that's growing every day. And it doesn't matter if you're sitting here in this room or if you're on a boat in the middle of the Mediterranean. It's relevant to all of us. So thank you. <laughs>